Tonight, we have the curator of birds, James Balance, whom I think all of you have met tonight. Uh, James has had nearly 30 years working with birds in zoological in organizations. <laughs> what? <laughs> nearly 30 years. Um, before the zoo, he worked at Baltimore Zoo and in private bird centers. No glasses, very big writing for notes. Um, do I need this? Do I need it, Mike? Can you hear me? Almost certainly not. I'm very well trained here. Should have done this earlier. Um, thank you so much for showing up here. Um, we've got... Take off the radio. That will really help. Excuse me. We can't see what's going on with that thing in front of you. <laughs> Look, okay. I've never been embarrassed about this before. Okay. <laughs> okay. It's all about the flamingos. They, they it's the flamingos. They mess me up. Can you hear me better? All right. Okay. Um, what I want to talk to you about now, uh, there's a huge crisis right now facing birds in this country in a zoo situation. There's a lot behind it. Um, zoo Atlanta has been doing, has really taken a huge step towards trying to improve the situation here at Zoo Atlanta because historically we've had some pretty rough bird areas. Um, and we're actually moving um, along to, I think, what's really, uh, but things that for birds here at the zoo could really change very quickly. Um, Birds. Birds are a huge business in this country. Um, who keeps birds? Uh, there's the public sector, there's us, there's, there's the zoos, sanctuaries, etc., where birds are on display. There's the private sector, people who keep birds as a, just as a hobby or as a source of income. That's a huge number of people. Pet owners, surprise, surprise, they are number one out there. More birds are probably held in private as private pets, and a lot of them are just parakeets. But uh, it's a big, big deal, the whole bird business. And then the commercial breeders of exotic birds. I'm not talking about chickens here. I'm talking about the type of birds we have here in the zoo, um, anything from a parakeet onwards. Um, <clears throat> zoos are a tiny percentage. We are at the tip of the bird iceberg in this country. Um, people tend to think about birds in zoos, but that ain't it. We are nothing. We are scum. Um, compared to the, uh, the, the sheer number of birds actually out there. Um, co there are commercial breeders who are mass producing birds. There are um, pri private people who are doing nothing but as a hobby, a very expensive hobby, trust me. Um, and then there's the zoo world. Where have all the birds gone? Anyone knows, know this guy? Remember seeing them in pet stores? Yeah, minor bird, gone. Not actually gone, but there's still a few in the private sector. Remember when you could see one in the equivalent of PetSmart? Always. People actually had them in their houses? Yeah. Mm. Not, not anymore. Actually, you can get, ma'am, I can sell you one for $1,300 right now. Available in Florida, just down the street. Just been hand raised. Um, but this, birds are disappearing. Um, species availability is at an all-time low. Um, what this means, I've been in this business 30 years. The number of species that are actually available to work with is minuscule. Things that I've worked with in my career, like I haven't seen in 15 years. Um, Wild-caught birds are far less available to supplement uh, collections. Now that is, I have very strong personal feelings on wild-caught birds, but it's actually a very, very, very major situation. Um, uh, bird breeding is still limited. We're really getting to a stage very soon now where we, there are going to be very few birds available on a routine basis to work with as a zoo. Already zoos are getting more and more standardized in their collections. The days when you could see 
a vast, vast array of birds, uh, of species. You know, there are 15 species of crane out there. About 10 of those species of crane, they would have three, four pairs of cranes. You know, here, I'm a crane man. We've got two species. That's it. Um, it's really a big, big issue because um, the birds just are not out there anymore. Private sector is, this is where most of the birds are in this country. Um, the private sector is anyone from someone who keeps a, pair of, a single pair of golden pheasants in the backyard to people who peop, uh, have 3,000 waterfowl. You know, huge, huge operations, mass-producing birds. Um, most people in the private sector tend to specialize. So, you know, you've got waterfowl collections, you've got pheasant collections, often those go together. A lot and lot, a lot of parrot breeders. And we're talking about parrot breeders who crank out the babies like that. Rose, I don't want to say it's, it's not quite factory production, but it's like, how fast can you kick out those babies? Um, and uh, so, uh, parrots, softbills. What we talk about when we discuss softbills is birds that actually don't fit any of those other char char uh, categories. They're not waterfowl, they're not pheasants, they're not parrots, they're not finches. It's a softbill. Oh, it, a starling, a minor. It's a softbill. It doesn't mean anything. Some of those softbills have very hard bills. They hurt like crazy. Um, but it's, uh, it ten a, lot, a great many of them are fruit eaters. There are very, very few private raptor people in this country, though. Um, there is a raptor business, but it's relatively limited in terms of its scope. Um, Waterfowl, pheasants, parrots um, used to have huge numbers of collectors. I worked in the private sector with waterfowl for six years solid, and we sold 90% of our birds to private people, people like you, who have a small pond in your backyard, maybe put a net, net over it, and you breed birds. Uh, and, and you just keep a few birds. And then, of course, well, you've got one little pond. Well, we can dig that second little pond. And w this was a commercial place, the second little pond. Well, we really liked the people who dug the third little pond as well. Or, you know, that housing estate where, you know, it's all about how big your house is. Imagine this in one of our glitzy new neighborhoods. We're going to put the pond in front of our house. Oh, we're going to put one too. Well, they've got a pond. We'd better have one too. Oh, well, well, everyone's got a pond now. Hmm. We'll put a pair of swans on them. Like, oh, we got a pair of swans in ours. They got swans. We can get swans. <laughs> we did this in Alabama. There was a housing estate. Everyone got a pond. Everyone got a pair of swans. The swans didn't know where the, the divider line between the properties was. They were out there beating the snot out of each other. They, it's like your male mute swan and your female mute swan. Woohoo! You know, didn't like their own. So we, there were swans going everywhere. This is, the pri is or can be the private sector. Um, <clears throat> other thing about private sector, we're talking about you know, just aren't a lot of birds out there compared to what they, they used to be. Um, there's a lot of increased federal and state regulation. Some of it is good, some of it is <laughs> lovely. Um, the, you, a lot of regulations are to maintain some sort of nominal control. Florida has some of the strongest regulations in terms of bringing birds in or animals in or out of its borders. Uh, yeah, that's only on the interstate. You know, you get off the interstate, uh, go around, uh, go cross country, come back in, forget it. So a lot of those regulations are really not very effective anyway. But if I buy, want to buy a pheasant from you and you live in the state of Alabama, if you are going to send that pheasant to me, and it's a legal transaction, that I've got to get a permit for it. I've got to get testing for it. I've got to send samples on my money, your personal money, right out of your checkbook, or you could be feeding your children, just a detail. Um, it, it becomes very, very expensive to keep birds in a lot of situations. And if you're a private person and the economy is not great, the economy is really being hit by... Um, uh, by the economy, it's really hitting private bird people. Um, the, out in the private sector, there are actually also no breeding pro, uh, 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 managed breeding programs by and large. Ha! Huh, we've got them all over the zoo world. We've got lots of those things. Actually, they're not doing us a whole lot of good either. We'll talk about that one later on. You know, we're the zoos. We're very important. We're very organised. <laughs> yes, thank you very much. But our breeding programs suck. Um, <laughs> 
Um, the other thing about private sector is they get very little support from zoos. Um, zoos have had to get more and more controlled about what they do with their animals. Um, ever since the case where a gazelle from St. Louis Zoo, this is about 15 years ago, was sold to a private person, but it was, you know, a very, someone you feel good about giving your animal to. That animal ended up in a public auction in the sta state of Arkansas. It was a very rare animal. It got traced back to St. Louis Zoo. The publicity was murder for them. It's happened to other zoos as well. And so more and more for just... Cover your butt. I'm sorry. I'm, uh, yeah, I'm being uh, inappropriate here. You know, we have to watch where our birds go because we cannot, if we send out a bird to a private institution, however good we think it is, it does not have a zoo Atlanta band on its leg in case someone should have a problem with it further down the road. Um, Mm -hmm. they come back. Yeah. yeah. We, we actually, Zoo Atlanta is very good about that. We sent, had a female vulture called Roswell, a king vulture. If you, if you know our king vultures down there, we had two. Ah, we have one now. Roswell, who is the devil incarnate, bless her. Um, she doesn't know she's a vulture. She thinks she's a human, but she doesn't actually like humans. Really kind of a bit of a problem of bird. When we sent, we finally found a home we felt was good enough for her, which was at another zoo, AZA institution, and we have a written contract there that if they feel, we, we feel we're committed to this bird, if she um, does not work out there, she can't, we have the option to bring her back here. We do not want that bird juggled around institution after institution after institution. She's screwed up. She is screwed up. But we do fit, Zoo Atlanta takes a very serious commit, commit, commitment to the animals that do go out. So this is the private sector in trouble with its bird breeding. This is, I'm talk, put this in between the uh, private sector and the public sector. The wild bird trade. Right now, these three birds here and this picture here, straight off the internet today. Magpie mannequins, 35 on sale for $25. Pri Red and yellow bar barbettes, 350 Darno's barbet, currently out of stock, 250 What didn't come up on the screen was add to cart. It's a, still a huge business. Um, the wild bird trade is huge. We do, as Zooland, we do not buy wild caught birds. We have to talk about that with a sort of, <laughs> uh, in just a minute. But we do not buy, buy wild caught birds uh, from dealers, etc. Um, a lot of other zoos are feeling the same way. Um, but it's a huge business, and you can go online today. Um, I won't tell you the website. Um, but you can go to these sites where you can buy things just like that. And these wild-caught birds are being dragged out, uh, out of the wild. Um, we've been talking about this is so shocking, so shocking, for 25 years. And in the mid-90s, there was a very serious cutback. And because of lobbying, guess what? Whoop. Well, maybe it isn't so bad to bring wild birds in after all. And all the laws that passed in the mid-90s got flipped around right around 1998 because, yeah, the lobbyists were stronger and uh, laws got uh, repealed. Um, so it's really been a huge deal. Um, but traditionally, so many zoos, so many animals have been totally, uh, so many animal people have been dependent on wild caught birds. And that's really a problem, especially uh, from our point of view, an ethical standpoint. I mean, I'm looking at some of you while I'm talking about wild caught birds and you go, you? Yeah, you, all right. Um, when we're talking about wild caught birds here, so that lovely pair of gold breasted starlings, madam, that you, you ordered from this company, ding, add to a cart. Um, did they remember to mention that for that two pairs of uh, that two birds that came to you, actually probably about six to eight wild uh, uh, starlings also died. They were the ones that weren't tough enough to make it through the quarantine period or the shipment or the holding space in Africa. Uh, wild caught birds, the ones that actually make it here, it's a drop.
you know, it's, again, it's the drop, a drop in the ocean compared to what dies on the way to getting to this dealer, on this way to you. Um, it's a tragic, tragic situation. And it's something that zoo, a lot of zoos are still buying from these people because they have these collections um, that have to be supported. When we talk, let's move on to the zoo thing. State of birds in zoos. Zoo birds are in trouble. Uh, we were just talking about the wild, wild caught birds situation. Again, Zoo Atlanta has, I don't know if you really understand how progressive Zoo Atlanta is. I mean, personally, I am so proud to be at this zoo. Sprina, who's the assistant curator, and I, we go around to other zoos and we think, yeah, I couldn't work here. Um, because there are when we opened our parakeet exhibit, we opened it with what? Parakeets? Yeah, I was surprised. But how many other zoo directors would have said, as well as those parakeets, you need to have at least six other sorts of birds. Well, I'm not sure they're going to get on. Open with at least six other sorts of birds. But I think it's going to be open. Yes, sir. Um, we don't have that here. Dennis would never dream of it. Dwight Lawson uh, would never dream of telling us to open it. With, you know, we didn't open with a quail. We didn't know if they'd work out. But we snuck them in. They're working out great. We're going to sneak some other things into that parakeet exhibit. But we're allowed to do it on our own time. That's a big, big deal in this business. I was talking to a friend, curator of another zoo in Florida today. It's like, she does not know how good, uh, how bad, well, she doesn't know how good it can be because she deals with that stuff all the time. State of birds in zoos here. Um, they're competing with mega vertebrates. Zoos, if you've been around zoos for a long time, you'll notice the number of animals in zoos has probably declined. The exhibits have got better. You remember when we had six species of bear? Wasn't that great? You know, those lovely cubby holes down in the heat? Oh, it was great. You could see a polar bear, you could see a and blah, 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 blah. It was great. You saw them all. Well, in some ways, it was great because you got a comparison thing. But were those exhibits nice or what? Um, so what zoos have been doing across the board, every type of animal, is reducing the numbers gradually and also... Um, but at the same time, you, you have fewer animals to look at. They're in better conditions, which is good. They're being better cared for, which is good. But um, you're not seeing quite as much. We're, we're weighing things against each other, and numbers are going, da are going down, but <laughs> exhibitry is going up. So you're, you're balancing two experiences here. In a lot of zoos now, not only do, and we're talking birds here, bird curators like myself, we're not just dealing with um, competing for space. We're uh, dealing with limitations on zoo geography. About 15 years ago, oh, in the zoo world, we need things to be African, Asian, South American. What that means is, um, you run, right now, no one builds South American exhibits. Why? We're not South American. South American. I'm sorry, no one breaks, breeds Asia, builds Asian exhibits because there are no Asian animals to populate them. Nothing can come out of, China, out of your, uh, Asia anymore since um, bird flu and uh, etc. Um, these things are really affecting the way we do things. But also, if, you just, if your zoo only has an African section, a North American section, I'm talking about North Carolina Zoo, you're very much limited, uh, not in a bad way at all, it's excellent, really excellent zoo. Um, but you're very limited on the number of birds you can keep. And you don't have enough birds, and there's something available, oh, it's from China, uh, may not be wild caught, but it's from China, you can't bring that bird into a, into a zoo. It's a huge, huge issue if you have empty exhibits and you don't have anything to go put into it. Um, the other thing, another thing that's going on in uh, zoo departments all over the place is there's a decline in animal staff expertise. If you worked in the old zoo here, um, with the six types of bear, you've got to learn the differences between all those bears. I mean, that's real expertise. You know, when you can do a comparison, know how one thing versus another might uh, work. Um, or the, uh, if suddenly the only bear you work with is a panda, well, <laughs> you don't know a whole heck of a lot about polar bears, do you? Your personal expertise is very limited. And with these declining number of anim animals in zoos, this is no, nothing against anyone coming into the zoo business, but if you come and work in our bird department, um, Sabrina and I can offer you 60 species of bird to work with. 60. If you go to, in the old days, it might have been 120.
but that's limiting your experience as a new keeper because we just don't have that number of birds. Nothing against anyone, but it is declining experience. There is also more and more of an emphasis on science. And you can have a PhD, but it does not tell you if a, the, your PhD will not uh, help you tell if that golden pheasant is sick or not. It's, can you pick up on it? We would much rather have um, someone who's just got it. So, that bird's not right. No, that bird is not right. Um, can't put my finger on it, it ain't right. That's a feeling. Um, and there's so much emphasis now on uh, scientific expertise that it becomes actually a problem uh, in certain places. Um, there was, you've got to answer, for us, golden pheasant, that's like, it's not quite a chicken, but you know, it's, a, it's not a $5 chicken, it's a $15 chicken. But a golden pheasant is a golden pheasant, we don't talk about it. A major bird curator, some, it was just posted uh, recently on a list of a major bird curator, didn't know what a golden pheasant was. You're by curator, you don't know what a golden pheasant is? It's ridiculous. Um, why do put zoos breed more birds? Huh. Anyone know what these disgusting little things are? <laughs> it's not a very good picture. They are parrots. Those are actually our baby um, uh, Ledbetter's, Major Mitchell's cockatoos down across from the uh, thing nasty, ugly little things, but they are gorgeous now. Um, there are fewer and fewer birds in collections. Um, if you have fewer birds, you don't breed as much. Um, we've got fewer and fewer exhibits. The, the, like we said earlier, the exhibits are much better, but um, there's not nearly as many birds in there. You know, if you keep 10 birds, you're not going to breed as many as if you keep 60 birds. Um, we've got more and more mixed exhibits. Our Living Treehouse is a lovely exhibit. It works, um, the birds look great, um, d just don't go there at 2 o'clock on a hot Sunday afternoon. Um, but it's a really good experience and when all the birds are really popping out there, that place hops. It's a lousy place to breed birds, absolutely lousy. Because if you want your peace and quiet in your little nest in the corner, it's like you've got a bunch of nosy birds saying, what you doing? What you doing? Hey, you got chicks there? You got chicks? Birds don't, a lot of birds don't like that. So this creates a real problem for breeding because that is a lovely exhibit, but you know, we can crank out our white-faced whistling ducks that are tough as old nails. We can crank out our superb starlings that you couldn't stop with a sledgehammer. Um, these things will breed no matter what, but the more sensitive stuff does not. Um, we've, we've got these mixed exhibits. We're also losing, we've already lost actually, a lot of those easily bred exhibits, uh, easily bred species. The golden pheasant, commoners muck. Gormit as much. Anyone can breed those things. I think two were bred in North American zoos last year. Two. You know, it's like, the chickens. Remember the chickens? Um, two were bred because no one's concentrating on them. They're just disappearing. Um, certain species or families lose out when six yeah, species come along. Um, when you're a true bird person, there are certain birds that come into your life. It's like, oh. Oh, that's gorgeous, you know. <laughs> gotta have, gotta have. For me, that's a Victoria crown. Anyone know a Victoria crown pigeon? Beautiful, big purple with a sexy. Um, you know, but you know, if you've got a golden pheasant in your exhibit, or you've got a sexy blue uh, crown pigeon for your exhibit, which you're going to give up on. You know, you only got one exhibit. Which you can have. Come on. <laughs> yeah, golden pheasants out. Um, this has happened all over the zoo world. And you see total cycles of what's in, what's out. There are birds that are trendy. Right now, any toucan is trendy. Oh my gosh, toucans are trendy. As I said, someone else, if you've got 25 grand right now, we can have a pair of toco toucans on exhibit in the zoo. Thank you. Um, but uh, animals just come and they go. Uh, breeding program, breeding li limitations within AZA programs. We consider ourselves a progressive zoo. 50% of the birds in our zoo are members of AZA breeding programs. I'm sorry, you and you are not approved for breeding. Um, oh, okay, we won't breed you. Um, that is a limitation. Now, good breeding programs are great when they're working, but what happens is just, we have a pair of rollers. If you know our living tree has savory, there's a pair of blue-bellied rollers. They are gorgeous. Yep. He is very valuable. She is very valuable. Pair them up. We need babies from them. Mm-hmm. Ew. Yuck. 
I, I ain't talking to her. She's got cooties. <laughs> this is what our rollers think of each other. They sort of calf of like, like each other. Well, we've been together a few years now. Maybe we can get it off. <laughs> Maybe we can uh, align ourselves. Uh, they actually laid eggs for the first time this year. But it's a pair of birds. Just because I say you and you belong together doesn't mean, just like in people, it doesn't work. And that's what these organized breathing programs don't always take into account. Um, if we ship a panda across country and it doesn't like, well, no, pandas are different because we cheat, we do artificial insemination, that, whatever a panda wants, we give it. Um, <laughs> but birds are not actually like that. Um, but programs, when they're working well, and we have an example, which we're going to get to, of a program that's working very well in this country, but um, a lot of programs can actually end up, number one, what will happen is, Everyone's supposed to be breeding their, blue, uh, their blue-bellied rollers, but no one's really breeding them, and some people aren't supposed to breed them. Suddenly, all the people who should have bred them, well, their birds didn't breed, and like, half the birds have disappeared. It's like, ah, oh, what should we do? Oh, we breed those ones we didn't really want to breed. Um, it's a real problem. Uh, managed programs are only as good as the people, the expertise of the staff looking after them, and, the, um, and <laughs> whether the birds like each other. Um, there's another big thing that goes on now. Higher standards of keeper care. Oh, that gets in the way so much. I can't tell you. you know, it used to be. Um, in the old days, if you had a line of 30 parrot cages, wang, crank them through, you know, food, water, food, water, food, water, food, water, no problem. Now we have to do nice things for them, like enrich them, give them things to chew on, clean the exhibit every day. We have to give them interesting food. We have to give it more than once a day. We have to give them fat puzzle feeders. How tedious. It's great. We love this stuff. We train our birds. You know, we train them to come down and sit on scales. I'm not, I talk only about birds here, but I'm talking about pretty much the gamma to animals, obviously all the mammals as well. Um, but that keeper time really takes away from some other things like Sitting and watching your buzz, letting it get on with it. You know, are you going to breathe? I don't know if you can breathe. You going to breathe? You, know, you don't have as, nearly as much time watching. We think our keepers under paperwork. So you know, we're doing the AZA thing, but keepers will sink under paperwork. Um, and then you know, you have to keep up on the paperwork. Why didn't you finish that keeper report today? I'm a horrible boss. Why did you not finish that keeper bot report today? Um, it really takes up a lot of keeper time that could also be spent reparching that exhibit. Okay, it's not quite right. They don't like it. Okay, we need more vegetation back here. We need some green stuff back th there. Um, it's really, it's a big problem and it takes away from the breeding that we do. Aesthetics. We used to have lines and lines of parody. Every zoo had gobs and gobs of these macaws and things. But uh, everyone, anyone seen our cockatoo exhibit? We put the green stuff in there every day for them to chew on. We put fresh logs in them. They look horrible very soon. The more we talk about aesthetics, the more things like parrots have disappeared out of zoo programs because you can't keep the exhibit looking good. No matter how much you try, parrots have buzz sores on their faces. They trash everything. So a parrot exhibit is almost impossible to keep looking nice. So what's Zoo Atlanta doing about it? Money, thank you very much indeed. Um, Zoo Atlanta has really, really decided to invest in its bird section. We've had some pretty rough stuff. We had a couple of, we've always had a good, some good places. We've always had enormous zoo, zoo moral support, as it were. Uh, my boss, Dwight Lawson, uh, uh, and Laurie Perkins, if you know them. Dwight Lawson's our senior vice president of all things important and animally. Um, <coughs> He has always been very, very supportive of um, uh, birds, but it's not quite, <laughs> knowing that you really support me isn't quite the same as giving me something. Um, <laughs> so, <laughs> Zero Atlanta has really invested in the last uh, 18 months in birds, and Springer and I, and the staff, are just so excited about what's going to be happening now. Um, we've got some really great new facilities we'll whiz through uh, now. We've got some top-of-the-line new equipment. Our incubators are Rolls-Royce incubators. They're not Rolls-Royce incubators, they're Grumbach. But Grumbach, you don't know about. Rolls-Royce incubators, we're getting the good stuff um, because the zoo believes and is uh, willing to commit. They believe in us. They believe in uh, what we're doing here as a zoo. 
Um, they're investing in staff training. We get to send staff out to learn st uh, to learn staff. Uh, we're sending keepers out to learn uh, how to be, uh, incubate art eggs artificially. That's, you, know, so you stick it in the, the oven and it comes out in 30 days as a chick. Not exactly. Much more complicated. Um, zoo's really putting money into that. Uh, last few years, we have managed to send keepers all over the place learning that stuff. Every year, we send a keeper to a place in North Carolina. It is death by ducks, but you are thrown in at lunchtime on the first day, and you are going to they absorb so much information in one week. It's a place with not a lot of protocols, but they breed birds. They crank them out. They crank them out. And it's a very, very successful place. It's a great place for a keeper to learn. But it costs money, so we send people there. Um, we are finally getting holding space for birds. And up until now, if we bred a bird and if it couldn't stay with its parents, well, where are we going to put it? They're giving us extra holding space. They're giving us more exhibits. Um, and Zoo are geographically flexible. We were talking about we're stuck in Africa, we're stuck in Asia, whatever. Uh-uh. In Africa, in the living treehouse, that's African. <clears throat> we have three non-African species in there. But that's because Dwight, our boss, is willing to flex that bit. Well, let's face it, you don't really care if a red-capped cardinal is in there from South America. Um, it looks stunning when you see it. So we're being allowed to cheat in that. That's a big deal. In most of the bird department in the zoo, we simply don't have to worry. Yeah, Australian, African, everyone should get on together. Um, it makes a huge, huge deal of a difference. Our propagation center, the joy of our life. This is what we would like to have opened today. Um, unfortunately, we've got some baby birds in there right now. Uh, we wanted people to see it. But the baby birds kind of took priority. You, know, you are second rate compared to baby birds. Um, this is one side of our um, propagation center. Um, it's an absolutely dedicated to breeding and holding space and also actually for rearing some chicks. Um, what makes this so fantastic for us is there's no one around. This is peace. So the birds that don't do well in the living tree house might do better in here. Um, why a propagation center? 15 years ago, AZA, do you all know AZA, American Zoo and Aquarium Association, the people we bow down to, we are a member institution, um, advised that zoos should be able to house 30% of their birds off exhibit in breeding setups so that you can support it. We already know that birds don't necessarily breed well in front of the public. If you look across a crowd of screaming kids and you're trying to decide to lay an egg, hmm, I might give up that day. Um, the... So it was very, very important, and we are still a very rare zoo in that we have a new propagation center. There are probably 15 in the country. <laughs> Denver Zoo just opened their 80-unit one. We have 16. Denver Zoo opened a $4.5 million 80-unit one. We kind of went, oh, and then we realized, we're getting 16. Whoa! Um, it's, a, it's very, very important for breeding. Um, up until now, as I said earlier, we just didn't have space to put our offspring. Um, and didn't have space for breeding the smaller sensitive type birds. Uh, we really needed the zoo to strengthen, strengthen our um, reproduction and be less dependent on other institutions. Half of my job right now is looking for more birds for our new exhibits, but we've got some young birds, and it's a barter system. I mean, today I was bartering gold-breasted starlings for baby superb starlings, and I, was bar I bartered oh, what is oh, a pair of racket-tailed rollers for some young whistling ducks. It's like there's no money going around, but we are helping other zoos now. We can, we're already st producing birds anyway, but now we're hoping to up that significantly. It's, it's lovely. We go in there, we touch the mesh. It's so clean and lovely and new. We <laughs> sniff it. You can smell the paint. Um, it's 16 units set up alongside of each other. Um, they have little food platforms, extra little doors. Top right of the right-hand picture, you'll see there's a shift door so that we can shift birds between, between cages so that they can, you know, if we're trying to pair you two up, we're going to put you side by side for a few days, and then if you seem to like each other, we'll open the shift. There's no ca question of going in, catching someone up, moving them into the next cage. You just open the door. All this makes a huge, huge difference to us. Um, we, we cut back on a lot of the keeper stuff in that building so we could have all these little bells and whistles in there. 
This is just a dummy setup. It's actually not quite as, uh, it's actually less than there is. But we have vegetation in there. We have nest boxes in there. They have an outdoor area. They have an indoor area. Um, if we have to go into clean, the birds can go outside. They're not disturbed. It's all about cutting down on disturbance. It is a glorious, glorious building. It really is. Um, it's air conditioned. Um, another thing we've done. We're redeveloping on the spine across from elephants there. That's where our blue cranes lived. Well, we better get rid of blue cranes. Well, should we? They're an important uh, program species. So the zoo said, well, no, we need to keep this species. And we took over half the Aldabra yard and we put the blue cranes in there. It's a relatively cheap exhibit, but it means we can keep on. And a lot of zoos that have tossed those cranes right out. And Zoo Atlantis says, no, we're going to keep on doing, doing these cranes. Um, that in the Aldabra yard wasn't really, the Aldabras weren't really using it. Um, <clears throat> the spine aviaries, I think we walked past these. We're very excited about these. We always had two yards right across from the elephants. Um, they were drab, they were dull, ugly. I mean, they had cool birds. They had the blue cr and cranes, the blue cranes, and they had the, um, and the ho ground hornbills. Well, the ground hornbills are coming back here, but they're coming back in style. This near end the, is going to be the ground hornbill exhibit. What we're actually looking here on the right-hand side, this is going to be those big glass viewing panels so you can have a really good view of that dead rat as, as Zazu is parading past with it. Because we do not want you to miss out on the ickies. Um, it's, a, it's going to be a really cool... What we've also done is, you can't see it, but this trellis goes further across behind the front as well. It means we, that was actually deliberate. It's not just a pretty trellis. We can put great perching up so they can be sitting on a perch right there through the glass across from you. They can't hop out, out over the top of the thing. Um, so those are the sort of little things that cost more. We have two aviaries in the middle, and then the other, other end is where our great big lapid face vultures that we love so much are going to come back on exhibit up there. They are going to look stunning, and we have an fantastic new piece of exhibitory unlike anything we've got in the zoo and you're going to have to come back and see that because it's so cool it's really cool it's sitting up there and everyone's drooling over it did you see what's up sitting up at the maintenance shop now that's going in the vulture yard no have you seen it oh it's awesome we're really really excited about this one um, we're also upgrading some of those horrid old aviaries down in the lower zoo um, they were, most of these aviaries put up 20 years ago temporarily um, we have been patching them. We have one aviary. You can punch your hand just about through the mesh. It's so thin. We have up to three layers of mesh down at ground level where it's rotted through. These are old aviaries. They need some uh, uplift. So we're getting that. We get, you're going to see a lot less of those, the plastic on the exhibits in winter, which is the only winter protection we've got now. Look, a shed. Ooh, heated. Lights. Windows. Um, this is moving forward. This is the zoo sincerely committing. Um, who breeds where? The uh, superb starlings. We're talking about what birds do we put where. We get, things like our superb starlings, they breed in a living treehouse aviary and they crank them out. They're tough, they're nosy, they're bossy. They can handle pretty much anything going on and you're still going to get babies. Amethyst starling. Everyone, anyone see these in the living treehouse? Yeah, once. That's about what you see if you spend a week here. Once. Um, they don't breed in there. They're too shy, they're too retiring. It's actually not the right place to be exhibiting. But, though they live fine, but they won't exhibit in there. So these are the high, high flash, gorgeous birds. Um, but this is the species we want to target to go into the, our new prop center because they're going to do much better. So in fact, this guy right here has two females sitting, two wives, sit, potential wives, sitting in quarantine right now, their 30 day quarantine. He gets introduced to a choice of two women um, in a few days time. Um, so we're definitely targeting those sensitive species. They need to crank this up. Um, one of the other things we talk about here is parent-reared birds versus hand-reared birds. Depends on type of bird. Everyone saw the flamingos today. What we've been doing for most of the last eight years is hand-raising every flamingo. That is hard darn work. It is not quite blood, uh, human blood, sweat and tears, but not flamingo blood, sweat and tears hard work raising those things. But those flamingos grow up and they're about as tame as a puppy dog. Um, they, flamingos are what we call very hard wired. Flamingos, even though they've been raised uh, just by hand, they basically still know they're flamingos. It helps not having a brain. 
um, when, when you only have two brain cells to talk to each other. Um, the, uh, they're very, very hard words. Word. Other birds like this laughing thrush, we're so proud of. We've been read these things on and off for the last eight years since we've been here, and we never, ever got them to parent raise the chicks all the way. Every single one of our breed, we had two pairs. Every single one of those birds was um, hand raised. So they would build the nests, they would lay the eggs, the eggs would be fertile, they'd hatch out the chicks, they'd feed the chicks. The chicks would leave the nest as they're supposed to do at 10 days old and the parents said, Eugh, what are you? There's something missing in their brains. This year for the first time ever we've parent raised because for the first time ever we have got a pair of birds and one of those birds is ha parent raised all the way through. He knows what he's doing. So mom, chicks came out of the nest at 10 days old, she went, Eugh. and he went, oh, I'm going to feed them, I'm going to feed them. We've raised them for the first time ever. So hand raising versus parent raising is a very, very big deal. Um, this is what we say is a hardwired species, not a problem. This is one of our chicks a couple of, a couple of days ago. Um, but other species, our ground hornbills, Zazu and Gumby, they are gorgeous birds, but they are, um, they are imprinted on people. They were hand raised. And breeders, forget it. Not a chance, never, because they think they're human. Uh, this, so Zoo Atlanta is very much anti-hand uh, rearing, except in flamingos. Okay, we're talking about species programs. Anyone seen one of these? Oh, yeah. uh, this is Rafiki, who we uh, packed off to meet some women in Miami, and uh, I believe he actually struck his stuff this year, and uh, they have their first eggs, or possibly chicks by now. So Rafiki's a daddy! Um, it's an SSP program, an AZA program. Um, the program's been going on for about six, seven years. The birds are breeding in several uh, zoos, but the numbers are not going up. And the big, big problem we've basically pinned down is m mortality in young birds up to about 80, a year, 18 months old. These are big, goofy, stupid birds. I'm sorry, I'm saying stupid. If there is a brick wall, and I'm standing here, and there's a brick wall there, I am going to run into it just to see what happens. Um, <laughs> It's not being fair. Basically, they're only moderately adapt. Uh, you know, they're birds with big open spaces. They like to run and take off. And they don't have very good breaks. So there are issues. If you go to our exhibit, it's the only exhibit in the zoo where the me mesh is soft and, soft and spongy. Um, it's not wire. It's uh, plastic mesh. And you can run into it at 30 miles an hour, as our male has done, and you bounce right back on your butt. Um, <laughs> It's little modifications like that that can make all the difference to a program. Um, the major cause, because the major cause of death is trauma. I'm going to be big and I'm stupid. Um, Zoo Atlanta actually has a very serious involvement with this SSP. I'm the vice chair of the SSP. Um, Katie Bagley, one of the keepers, um, is the sort of keeper liaison, puts out a newsletter uh, through the year about it. Um, we have major involvement. We've done a lot of the surveys, um, etc. So we really wanted to invest in this. Uh, we have a single pair, but in 2009, that would be this year, we actually agreed to raise some additional chicks, not from our pair who are too young, but to raise some additional chicks. Um, these chicks were coming from the National Zoo in Washington, D.C. Well, how do you get them here? We, we send someone to Washington, D.C. But the last thing you want to do as you're coming through uh, security is take your nice big Cory eggs, little developing embryos, and zap them with x-rays. It's not good for the chick. So you ever try sneaking anything through past T past TSA or Homeland Security, not a wise idea. So we put in quite a lot of legwork talking to these people, and they were outstanding. So Chris, our keeper, went to DC a week ago, 10 days ago now, and we talked to these guys. Chris is walking back into Reagan International Airport, carrying his little cooler, wearing a Zoolander shirt, just like me. He walks up. He has not got security. Are you Chris, sir? Come on this way. Chris gets escorted by TSA, past every single person in line, up to the scanner, they take, take the thing from him, he steps through, they scan him, he steps back, picks up the eggs, steps the other side, scan it through, they take him right the way through, he is about 30 seconds. And they actually didn't scan Chris at all, they didn't care about Chris, all they cared about was the eggs. He had six TSA people working with him. It was beautiful. So gosh bless them, we love them. Here's Chris with his eggs in his little cooler. One round trip ticket to Washington. One small cooler, chemical hand waters for heat. 
Carl's brand for padding, thermometers, thermometers for temperatures, and two well-developed eggs. And one stressed out keeper. Because he's trying to keep those. He has chemical hand waters, he has a cooler, and he has the top. He has open top. Chris, aim for 99 and a half degrees. It's 96 degrees, it's 96 degrees. Chris, who is cool, calm, and collected, arrived here shaking by a ball of nerves because he had these very, very important eggs. Did the eggs take survive the travel? Six anxious, anxious days. You know, this is the drum roll. Yep! Gorgeous! <laughs> so, this is the first of those Cory Bastard eggs that hatched out last. The, 10 days ago? Nine days ago. Um, weird. Really, really weird. But this is what we got out, and these birds are utter joy to us. Three hours later, a new member of a species survival program species. Um, this is what we wanted to show you in the prop center. It just wasn't feasible. Um, but we are raising these things, and they are joyous. They are a lot of work, little darlings. But um, eight days in counting when I wrote this, 60 days of hand feeding, five months of extra care, 15 months before they sent to other. Uh, uh, institutions, it's a serious commitment. They live on mice, 30 cents a piece. Um, this is a very big financial commitment for Zoo Atlanta, but they're doing it, and they're doing it for the right reason, and we are very, very happy about it. Whee! I'm being baby Cory. Um, we've had a great season all around. We brought this pair of birds in in April, I think. We, they'll breed next year. Uh-uh, this is the chick, hatched last week. Um, outstanding, we couldn't believe it, but uh, they, cr they cranked it out. We got our first budgies. Um, gorgeous! I'd rather have a Cory Bastard. Um, but our breeding program has begun. We, Zooland has invested so heavily in us. I mean, I'm sorry, I hope, I'm glad this is not all we can give back to them. Um, did we have any other exhibits? Of course we did. They wouldn't let us name it this. Death by parakeets. Um, love this picture. This was taken at opening day. Here's Dennis on the right. Cool, calm, collected. Every single other person ducking to avoid a parakeet. Lovely, lovely, lovely. Um, Spreer and I are so proud of the institution we work for. They are investing so heavily. Birds really are in trouble in this country. Um, we are so fortunate to be working here. I hope you can all at some point see the prop center. I hope you can see a bunch more baby birds. Baby birds, by the time you see them, tend to look like adults, unfortunately, so it's uh, not so great. Um, nothing like a baby panda which you can milk for, you know. <laughs> it's a baby, it's three years old. It's having babies. It's a baby. Um, but no, thank you so much to Zoo Atlanta for everything they do. Thank you. Hi, someone had a question there. Wind power. Wind power, as you probably know, is sort of touted as one of the great new green energy sources. Um, it, I don't know an awful lot about it. It is having some issues, um, especially wind uh, turbine farms off the coasts, where off coastlines, especially close enough to coasts where they can be affected by birds traveling up and down the coast. Um, there are some real problems with turbines off the west coast of Sto Scotland. Um, for 30 years, they were fighting to reintroduce the white-tailed sea eagle to Scotland. They finally did it. They were breeding, set up a wind farm, bam, 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 started kicking off some white-tailed sea eagles because those turbines move at anything up to 100 miles an hour. and doesn't take much 100 miles an hour to knock you off your They are causing problems. I don't think it's really known. Um, there are major migration corridors within North America and I could see in certain places that are very bad to be putting up a wind farm. Some places may mu be much safer than others. I'm sure there are some, I suspect there are some hidden figures out there. You know, I mean, if you own a wind, op a wind operation, you're going to tell people how many birds you're picking off, up off of the ground uh, every day? Probably not. Um, it's horrible. I think we're going to be balancing that one for a long time. One of the other big, huge causes of uh, death in wild birds is strikes in win with windows, uh, fl just flying into windows. And the, one of the major green technologies is more glass in buildings. There is no really effective, viable method 
of coating a gla glass yet uh, to prevent birds flying into it. Um, so actually bird deaths on glass are going up. Um, it, it's a problem. Um, and yet we're all trying to go green. You're being good on one side and you're killing on the other side. And it's like, where do you go? Any other questions? Yeah. It does to some degrees. Um, a lot of cold weather birds will stand on one leg. Um, on the other hand, it was, felt like 150 degrees out there in front of the exhibit just before this meeting. And there were birds with the feet tucked up. Keeping warm? I don't think so. Um, so it, it, some, to some degree, it depends on the species. Um, there are sp certainly species of Arctic, uh, Arctic birds that you know, roost on one leg, especially gulls and things like that. And they are specially designed. Uh, so basically, the amount of blood, they have massive restriction of capillaries in cold weather. So the amount of blood flowing down to, the, uh, to, a, to a bare, naked, webbed foot is, all, is reduced to the barest minimum to keep the foot alive, as it were, uh, thus saving uh, loss of body temperature. Um, these Chilean flamingos, they stand on one leg, whether it's freezing cold. You know, there is no temperature here in Georgia in the eight years I've been here where we have to worry except if we can't keep the water clean, water clear of ice. And so it is in some things, certainly in some, uh, in the species, actually like there are three species of flamingo that come only from the highlands of the Andes Mountains in South America. And those birds, yes, absolutely. But a bird that spends his entire life uh, on a soda lake in East Africa, uh-uh. No, heat retention is not, to, heat loss is far more important, but th yet they still tuck their legs. So it's probably going to depend on which species you're talking to, about. Yeah. Do any of the species uh, require heat in the winter? Flamingos? And or just yeah. birds in general? Birds in general. Yeah. Birds I'm sorry? Birds in our zoo. The birds, birds in our zoo, absolutely. Um, the, in the living tree house, we have a lot of birds that have to come off exhibit in winter. All those little, you know, most of those little pretty starlings, there are certain birds we manage to keep out. Because of the design of the living tree house, we added in some things. So our beautiful taracos, they were the very first slide, the purple birds with the red and yellow on the face. Those birds actually stay out year round, but we have a holding area at the back of the exhibit. If you're standing looking out, into the, it's the back left side. Where they will go in in, uh, in really cold weather if it's co uh, um, and, well they go in every night and get warm there. Um, there are other birds that pretty good, the superb starlings that are out there the glossy things blue on the back brown on the chest they are actually remarkably cold tolerant they scare the bejesus out of us sometimes. Um, we discovered because they have access indoors if we know it's going to get 16 degrees we will feed them inside in the winter we only feed inside they come in. 16 degree night, we'll just close the door on them, keep, force them to stay inside. Sometimes they don't come in. And we discover to our horror, we thought they, we put out heat lamps everywhere. We've got the other building. We discovered to our horror on, it was, what was it? It was high teens last year, one of the coldest nights. Discovered to our horror, they spent the entire night outside and they were absolutely fine, thank you very much. And we come from East Africa. It all depends on the species. But we showed that up, often we have to put plastic around those old aviaries. Um, we're getting away from that because we're getting proper shed, sheds attached, heated sheds. Um, that makes all the difference. Um, so yes, a lot of them are cold sensitive, but we're also going to be targeting more in the future birds that can handle anything, like a flamingo or uh, as you wing magpies, which some of you may know, very fast moving birds. There is no temperature, like our white crested laughing thrushes, no temperature. We put out heat lamps for them because it makes us feel better and they laugh at us. Um, so, um, yeah, there's a, there's a big variant in relative cold tolerance, but we try and take care of that. And heat in summer also, is that? Heat in summer, we really do avoid, I mean, I would n we would never bring in a pair of snowy owls. It's just not fair. Mm -hmm. um, there are some things, yeah, I just don't think we should have here. Um, but, yeah, and snowy owls, not more. Yes, sir? Sorry, didn't. Uh, right now, 
We have a pair of things called wreath hornbills, great big Asian hornbill like this. They've been off exhibit for most of eight years, occasionally on exhibit, but basically off exhibit. It takes the breeding cycle for a wreath hornbill is the male and female decide, okay, we're going to breed this year. They decide on their nest site. The female hops into the nest. The male seals her in completely. She has nothing but a little slit to look at. Oh, and there she lays her eggs. She sits on those eggs for 40 days. The chicks hatch out. She feeds that chick for, for, for about three months. We have a female hornbill and a baby. They've been in that box now. The baby's been in there for three months. The female's been in there for four and a half months since, what's that, February or something? March? Um, and we are waiting for those birds to break out of the box. Um, there's nothing we can do about it. We have no control. We have a camera in there. We pray. We just literally play, pray. It is a huge deal to breed one of these things. We are so proud of it, and we are so scared and so nervous every single day. We take video of them every day. They're all right. It's the male. They're dependent on the male. Bringing every bit of food is brought by the male. It's like, what if Beetlejuice, the male, has an off day? You know, that means the kid and the mom uh, go short on food. So we videotape them every day. We count how many pieces of food they get. I mean, we have more of a life than this, but this is what we're doing because we want this to work. Yeah, those hornbills make us nervous, and the flamingos that could fly away make me very nervous too. Hi. Oh, the Cory bastard. Because it's a species survival program, pretty much we do what we are asked to do. Um, when you join a species survival program, basically, if you are the program administrator and you tell me to send my bird to Miami, I bow down and I send my bird to Miami. Um, when you join a species survival program, you, are commit, you as an institution commit to do, doing what you are asked to do. Um, and so, no, basically, Cory bastards are not a species that are bought and sold at all. It's like, you want quarry bastards? It, all profit motive has gone out of it, which is great. Um, it's just, so our, we're raising these two chicks. They will go wherever we are told to send them when they're, coming, when they're of age to be sent out. So how do you get more? We talk to, well, it doesn't hurt being the... Um, how do we get more? Uh, we, don't need, we only have room for one pair here. What we're doing when we're raising these two chicks, we desperately need more Cory Busters in the population. But the zoo that sent it to the National Zoo, they don't have a lot of time for hand-rearing chicks, and Corys really need to be ha raised by hand because they're so fragile. Um, they don't have time to raise six chicks. They have time to raise two chicks. So it's like, do you throw away these very valuable eggs? Oh, well, toss them in the trash. Um, because you can't, don't have time for them? No, you try and find someone else to do it, and we, uh, we volunteered to do it, actually. Well, we said, do we have time? No, we don't have time. We'll do it. Um, yeah. Fifteen months. You know how big our current birds are? Well, our current male right now stands about like this. He is full height, but he hasn't barked up. He's a teenager. He's two. He, by the time he's five, he'll be in condition. Right now, he weighs right, probably right around the 20, 25 pound mark. He's been, going to be down close to 40 pounds. Not taller, but you know, beefing out. His attitude right now is, I am, going, I am trouble. Once he weighs 40 pounds and saying, I am trouble, uh, we have got trouble. Um, that, that aside, when they, they're sent out, depending, there's a huge size difference between a male and a female. So a female going out is going to be a about this height, a male going out at 15 months is going to be about this height. Um, but skinny. Skinny little things. Uh, okay. We, we would like to get the two chicks on display. Um, it's slightly tricky um, because you want pictures. Ah, talk to me afterwards. Um, uh, we would like to get them on display because it's a good PR thing apart from anything else, and we're all about PR. Um, but one thing we want to do, we want to, once they're about this tall, we want to get them out where the, the ad adults are, or the immaturals actually, um, in their exhibit. But they'll have to be tucked kind of at the back there where they won't be easy to be seen. But we want to great raise these birds seeing other Cory Bustards. 
Um, Corybus is a species you can raise by hand and not really affect the breeding down the road. Um, they're hardwired. <laughs> Anything else? Good. Well, thank you so much. I talked probably too long. Um, it's great to see you here. Um, do be on the lookout for changes because if you haven't met her, Sabrina, the assistant curator, is up here, top right. Um, we are, we've worked together for seven years now. Um, everything we do here is collaboration. And if you see Sabrina around, she rocks. <laughs> I love you, Sabrina. <laughs>